Welcome back, everyone, to Pontus Fathom Press. This is our weekly podcast, uh, episode number 16. Today we're going to talk about Solomon Cain, uh, King James demonology, you know, the Elizabethan age, and sort of how the Puritans fit in with Howard's world building. Let's, you know, we'll talk about the Puritans. We'll talk about Elizabethan sense of magic and then how that transitioned into King James with the King James Bible and demonology and how that all of those kind of factors uh, fit in with Robert E. Howard's, you know, creation of this character, right? So I think that this character is a really fun way to get us to the 1600s, all right? Because there's a lot here. I mean, it's very thin, but I think that there's something right under the surface that's very, very deep and very profound. So I think we kind of go into it. So first of all, for those of you who don't know, Solomon Cain is basically a Puritan uh, adventurer, swordsman. It's definitely a Weird Tales uh, character. So the idea is he is against witchcraft and evil. He's from the Elizabethan slash King James times, late 1500s, early 1600s. But what's fantastic is kind of like a Conan also who travels the world. You have uh, Solomon Cain, Solomon L. Cain, going out through pirate voyages uh, through Africa and encountering ancient evils and witchcraft, befriending people along the way, uh, fighting the good fight against evil. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an odd mix of, you know, this Puritan kind of values who's strong enough to stand against evil. And in a way, that it's a parallel with Conan, right? Because you know how Conan, we've talked about it in our Conan po- podcast about Conan and uh, theosophy. Conan is very anti-magic, right? Th- Conan is not interested at all in sorcerers. And somehow he, he also seems to have this resistance to that magic, right? And so, so maybe we'll go a little bit into maybe just a flavoring text here of Solomon Cain. Um, I'm just going to read this one quick chapter, one quick part. Solomon Cain slept and in his dreams were vague, chaotic, haunted with suggestion of pre-human evil, in which at last merged into a vision vivid as a scene in waking life. Solomon dreamed he woke with a start, drawing a pistol. For so long had his life been that of the wolf that reaching for a weapon that was his natural reaction upon waking suddenly. And his dream was that a strange shadowy thing had pierced upon the great branch close by and gazed at him with greedy, luminous yellow eyes that seared into his brain. The dream thing was tall and lean and strangely misshapen. And you have a picture here in the, in the margins of this winged death, you know, with the narrow yellow eyes. And Cain dreamed he waited spellbound while uncertainty came to his eyes. And then the creature walked out on a limb as a man would walk and raised great shadowy wings, sprang into space and vanished. And then Cain awoke upright, the mists of sleep fading. And then he looked up and the Gothic-like branch of the tree was empty save for himself. The dream had been, after all, so vivid yet fraught with inhuman foulness. He lingered in the night wind. Again, he slept under the shadowed wheel of the stars, circling again and again as a vulture circles a dying wolf. Okay, so here's Solomon Cain. You can kind of see him springing into action here, right? So Solomon Cain, adventurer. But we have Robert E. Howard. And sort of like, where where does this sort of fit in? So maybe we'll start out with, let's go back to Queen Elizabeth, right? So Elizabethan age. Uh... Obviously, lots of interesting things in Queen Elizabeth's age. We have the, uh, and stories that probably Howard would know about, right? So Howard was a history buff uh, to some degree, right? So he would, he would know the whole pilgrim story, right? So the whole, found, the whole foundation of America is on Puritans traveling across the ocean to America, which is definitely a product of uh, Elizabeth. But let's, we'll get into the Puritan thing uh, in a bit. One thing I'll call out here is, uh, it says... Before Elizabeth had been on the throne for 10 years, the hotter sort of Protestants uh, who invade most loudly against the failings of the church had already been christened the Puritans. 
So the Puritans were against the failings of the church, right? So Solomon Cain is of this tradition in, in Howard's mind. He's so pure that he, he's even more pure than the religion, right? Um, the epithet Puritans had been dreamt up either by papists or atheists or men extremely vicious. Men such as these felt the term implied there was a bunch of isolated extremists where it was their contention that was widely recognized that the church was in, in need of further reform. And so that sort of zealot, zealousness of Solomon Cain gives us the flavor of this adventurer, right? He is, a, he is the man who, who's even against his church, right? And in the same kind of breath, we have this other side of, of things where it is Elizabethan age is kind of an age of magic, right? So you have... Yes, there's Puritans looking at the fallen church, but look at John, uh, John D. Right. So if you go into Queen Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth's age, and again, this is the late 1500s, uh, you can say the occult philosopher John D. Uh, as a result of repeated pleas from D. in 1852, Elizabeth had prevailed upon the Archbishop of Canterbury to confirm D. in the possession of two rectories, which were bestowed upon him by Edward the Sixth. D was so absorbed in his work on the reformation of the calendar, right, that he failed to deal with this. So here is John D, very well positioned. And who is John D? Oh, he was someone who was quite versed in occult like happenings, right? So you have John D's Book of Five Mysteries, for example, where uh, D is trying to speak with angels. Uh, and a lot of John D's uh, work carries on into things like the Golden Dawn and things like that. So Elizabethan age, you know, you also have the whole Shakespearean angle of the Elizabethan age. So Solomon Cain references a few a few things that are Shakespearean even, where he says, um, all is foul and foul, foul is fair, right? Something like this, which is, I think is from Macbeth, right? So all is foul, foul is fair. And you see that there's this Macbethian tone to supernatural. Uh, you know, so back to the, uh, the the Puritans again. We have this idea of of the good versus evil, right? So Solomon Cain, even his name represents it. He's Cain, which is the left hand, and he's Solomon, which is the right hand. The wisdom and the sin. He's like the sort of the man who's torn between the two worlds, and that's a, a quite a Manichaean view. So here we have um, Sir Thomas Alfred Spaulding's Elizabethan demonology. And here he says, the second principle is that of the Manichaeists, the division of spirits into hostile camps, good spirits and evil spirits. This is much more common belief than the Orthodox is willing to allow. There is hardly any religious system that does not recognize a first source of evil as well as the first source of good. But the spirit of evil occupies a position of varying importance. In some systems, he maintains himself as co-equal of the spirit of good. And others, he sinks to a lower stage, remaining very powerful to do harm, but nevertheless under the control in the matters of importance of the more beneficent being. In each of these cases, the first principle is found operating, ever argumenting the ranks, monodiabolism being as impossible as monotheism, and hence the importance of fully establishing the prop proposition. So now this is an odd word. We never see this word. We know monotheism, but we don't know the word monodiabolism which is something that people were sort of still wrapped up in the superstitions of, let's say, in Elizabethan times. The last and most important of these principles is the tendency of all theological systems to absorb into themselves the de deities extraneous to themselves, not as gods or even as evil spirits. The actual existence of the foreign deity is not for a moment disputed. The presumption in favor of innumerable spiritual agencies being too, f too strong to allow. So the idea of here is that the elaboration of the belief in demons is in that the uh, even though when we are pious in the religion, there seems to be in the Elizabethan times at least the quiet adoption where there's still belief in the spirits, even though they're all Christianized, there's still a bit of this Santeria going on, right? There's still a bit of this demon worship or angel worship, for example, right? So you have this kind of uh, and this is where you see it throughout Shakespeare's writing. There's always a call to spirits. There's ghosts. There's, uh, you know, the witches. There's another number of these Shakespearean things that we can see evidencing that, right? So, so with, 
with uh, Solomon Cain as a puritanical fighter, freedom fighter, let's also think of Howard, you know, what, you know, why a Puritan? Well, one thing that I remember just growing up in New England is that we always grew up with the stories of pilgrims founding New England, right? So we, we kind of grow up with this story. So, you know, in um, if you take a look at this uh, picture, the, it says the Mayflower and the colon, col colonists and the Mayflower arrives at Plymouth in 1620. Again, moving from the age of Elizabeth to the age of King James, where King James has his commissions his Bible and writes his demonology. Again, it's sort of a, a shift in thinking. Uh, you see the Plymouth Rock with 1620, the colonies of that. Um, you know, the depiction in the movie The Witch, I don't know if you guys seen it, this movie The Witch, but there's a Puritan and he, um, his family, they get, they get um, uh, exiled from their colony and they have to go build a house in the woods and then there's a witch preying on them. In, in, in the movie, but you can see that this, you can see the vibe of the Pur Puritan. So you got to kind of imagine that's the Solomon Solomon Cain character. The other side of Solomon Cain too, though, is in Elizabeth's, um, you know, in the Elizabethan kind of character of Sir Walter Raleigh, right? So if you see Sir Walter Raleigh again as another uh, influence of this, Sir Walter Raleigh, uh, the basically the pirate Sir Walter Raleigh, right? But the, pri pi the pri pi pirate who is part of Elizabeth's court and inner circle, right? So he is sent off. Uh, the following year, another English fleet positioned itself near the Azores in hope of catching the Spaniards on their transatlantic route. Sir Walter Raleigh uh, had lost, had invested in the venture, but the queen has also provided nine ships so um, by this time, however, King Philip had taken steps to protect his bullion imports and off the feral, the English were surprised by a fleet of Spanish warships. With the exception of Sir Richard Grenville's revenge, which was captured after an epic fight, the English ships all managed to escape. So here you have Sir Richard Grenville, who's an actual, Sir Gr Sir, uh, actual pirate who's with Sir Walter Raleigh. Uh, going off after Spanish treasure for, for Queen Elizabeth, right? So, um, so we'll come back to Grenville there. So you have that Sir Walter Raleigh feel of the pirating adventurer going off to the New World, returning back to Queen Elizabeth with his spoils. You've got these ideas of the Puritans also going across. Um, we see here in the uh, history, the Pilgrim Fathers who founded New England were similar to maybe uh, Solomon Cain. The Puritans were quite uh, unpopular in England at the time. And this is why they left for America. So you're thinking from Howard's writing, you have Solomon Cain, a solo Puritan going out in the world. Uh, many earnestly desired to return the purity and the simplicity which characterized the primitive church. This is of the Puritans. They regarded many of the established customs of the English church as monuments of idolatry. Look, we have John D. John D. is in Queen Elizabeth's court with his Enochian magic, right? Probably knew of the Picatrix, right? That astrological book from the 1200s, right? Probably a book in his library. And, and perhaps even uh, of necromancy. You know, he talks to about uh, uh, Edward Kelly and John D. are talking to spirits, right? So... This would have seemed quite blasphemous. And this is where that fervor of the New England witch hunts comes out of. So we'll just continue. They recognized many of the established uh, customs of the English church as monuments of idolatry. And they could not in conscience unite in her worship. But the church being supported from civil authority would permit no dissent from her forms. Attendance upon her service was required by law. And unauthorized assemblies for religious worship were prohibited under the penalty of imprisonment, exile, and death. So England declared the Puritans to conform or harry them out of the land or worse. So the Puritans were given an ultimatum. You can't worship separately from how our church works. You have to conform to the Protestantism of the day, the monarchical uh, Anglicanism probably. And then, um, so hunted, persecuted, and imprisoned, they could discern in the future no promise for better days. 
and many yielded to conviction that for such a world would serve God according to the dictates of their consciousness, England was ceasing forever to be a habitable place, said J.G. Pelfrey in the History of New England. Some at last determined to seek refuge in Holland. Difficulties, losses, and imprisonment were encountered. Their purposes were thwarted and they were betrayed. And so hence, they left their houses, their goods, their livelihood, and then some of them went off to, to America, right? So the first constrained the separate from the English church. The Puritans joined themselves with a solemn covenant as the Lord's free people to walk together in all his ways made known to them. And they left for New England, right? So we have Puritans leaving for New England. We have Solomon Cain, a Puritan in the world. Um, all right, so... So we start moving now from that Elizabethan age into this uh, age of King James, right? And in King James, you know, we also have Solomon Cain. Uh, let's, let's have a passage here. Uh, Solomon Cain's fervor, let's call it, as a Michaeline challenger of evil. So James comes out with not only commissioning the Bible, Right? Not only does King James uh, um, commission the Bible, but he also commissions a demonology to be made. And I'll, maybe we'll quickly read from this demonology. Uh, it says, King James is, is uh, the fearful abounding in this time of the country. The detestable slaves of the devil, the witches or enchanters, has moved me, beloved reader, to dispatch in this post the following treatise of mine to serve for a show of my learning and ingenuity. Both that such assaults of Satan are most certainly practiced and that their instruments merits must severely be punished. So the idea is the first speaking of magic in general and necromancy in special, the second of sorcery and witchcraft, and the third contained a discourse of all those kind of spirits and specters that appear and trouble people together with the conclusion of the whole work. So it's almost like an answer to the superstitions of the Elizabethan age. The demonology comes up. And here... We have this concept also of um, maybe Solomon Cain as a Michaeline knight, right? He's some kind of uh, warrior in service of St. Michael, in a way. And, you know, in, in Rudolf Steiner, the Archangel Michael, uh, he talks about that it is the job of Michael to slay the devils. And, you know, and this is where, you know, St. Michael is the sort of in the Catholic point of view, he's a saint of police. He's the saint of people who are fighting against evil, right? So, so we have some of that, some of that uh, similar, similar mystery, let's say, where he is tasked with this Michael's task, his mission in ours, Steiner says in the Archangel Michael, is his job is to redeem the devil. But if we twist it into a Manichaean view, like the Solomon and the Cain version, right, where uh, good and evil are fighting, and this is a similar theme we, theme we see, you know, something like a Constantine, we see this in Constantine in fiction, we see it throughout characters who have to do the dirty work, right? So Solomon Cain is kind of like the guy who has to do the dirty work. So let's read this. Um, in the floor became level. Uh, Cain smiled crookedly, amused and relieved. Bats, of course. The cave was swarming with them. Still was a shaky experience as he went on and the wings whispered through the vast emptiness of the great cavern. Cain's Puritan mind found space to dally with a bizarre thought. He had wandered into hell by some strange means. And were these in truth bats, or were they lost souls winged throughout everlasting night? Then thought Solomon Cain, I will soon confront Satan himself. And even though this, his nostrils were assailed by the horrific scent fetid and repellent. The scent grew as he went softly on, and Cain swore softly, though he was not a profane man. He sensed the smell betokened some hidden threat. However, he felt perfect confidence in his ability to cope with any fiend or demon, armored as he was with his unshakable faith of creed and the knowledge of righteousness and cause. So here he is in pure puritanical cavalier manner. Uh, he comes across a beast and it says, this Satan thought Cain as his eyes swayed above him. And the next, this is Satan thought Cain, 
right? So it's just some creature, but he kind of, his mind goes right to Satan, right? So it's very interesting. Um, so we've read this. And let's kind of talk about some other aspects. He had the dream of Solomon Cain. I think I had this quote here. So yeah, so King James. So King James coming afterwards commissions this uh, the King James Bible. And we even see uh, in Solomon Cain's stories, uh, Solomon Cain's given the staff. I think we have a picture of it. The staff of Solomon, the rod of Solomon, right? And there's so many rods in the Bible, like, like, like Moses, or uh, there's a number of rods throughout um, uh, the Bible. So interestingly enough is with the King James Bible, Especially in this, uh, and this is uh, especially in the Moon of Skulls, you can see that um, Solomon Cain is actually quoting the Bible here. So if you see, uh, And in truth it shall come to pass that he who fleeth from the noise of fear shall fall into the pit, and he shall come up out of the midst of the pit, and shall take, be taken in the snare, for the windows upon high are open, and the foundations do shake. So that is directly from the book of Isaiah. And I think I've got this 24, maybe 24, 15. The glory of Israel. Fear and the pit and the snare are upon the inhabitant of the earth. And it shall come to pass, and it shall come to pass, that he who fleeth from the noise of fear shall fall us into the pit, and he shall come up out of the midst of the pit and taken to the snares as the earth does shake. For thou hast made a city of heap. Uh, for thou hast made a city of heap, a little further down. Uh, defend a city of ruin, a place of strangers to be no city. It shall never be built. It shall never be built. So here we are. Now this is the King James side of things. So we've gone to the, from the Elizabethan side to the King James side. And stray, stay yourselves in wonder. Stay yourselves and wonder, it says in the King, King James uh, uh, here. Uh, it says in Solomon Cain, Ye cry out and cry. And then it says, Stay yourselves and wonder, cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. So you can see he's a man reading. I mean, this is, this is Howard reading from the Bible through Solomon Cain kind of giving us that experience, right? Uh, and, and maybe lastly in this, that's kind of an interesting point. We talked about Sir Richard Grenville. So Solomon Cain also serves with Grenville. So here he is. He's the man of angel. He's a man of Michael, right? He's the warrior against evil. His rod is the rod of Israel, perhaps. You can see here we have in the book of Numbers... So in Africa, Solomon Cain is, is gifted the, the, the rod of Solomon. And so the, maybe the idea is that the rod passes from Solomon to Africa. And, and here we have a quick note on the rod of Solomon where it says, the scepter. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Seth. Right, so here he is with his, his rod. He has, a, he's the combater of evil. And similarly, this wraps in with uh, the demonology of King James. You know, we have here James saying, I touch not particular thing of the devil's power. I rely upon type, leaving appearance and differences to be comprehended therein. As for example, speaking the power of magicians in the first book and sixth, I say, they can be suddenly be brought into them, all kind of dainty dishes by the familiar spirit. Such as a thief delights to steal a spirit, he can and quickly secretly transports the same. And now the same reason, witchcraft is a special, and fifth chapter, I say, prove by diverse arguments that witches can, by the power of their master, cure or cause disease. So witches can cure disease. And now the same reason the devil himself is a disease. 
and for the devil's intentions there's ever to perish either in the soul or the body. So here you have uh, sort of Howard selecting across from all of these different components. Finally, uh, a note, again, note from the demonology. The devil's contract with the magicians, the division. From time that once plainly began to contract with him, the effect of their contract consists in two things, in forms and effects. For although the contract be mutual, I speak to thee of that part wherein the devil obliges himself to them. By forms I mean in which forms fashion he shall call unto them when they call upon him. And by effect I understand that what special sorts of services he binds himself to be subject unto them. The quality of these forms in effect and lesser and greater accord to the skill and art of the magician. By such a proper name which he shows upon them either in likeness of a dog, a cat, an ape, or such like other beasts, or else to answer by a voice only. The effects are to answer to such demands that concerns the disease or the, his own particular menagerie. So he talks about sort of like shape shifting or miracles, the difference between God miracles and the devil's miracles, right? So um, lastly, we just kind of maybe just end in a in a thought about the last name of Solomon. So Solomon Cain, we know the Solomon part, the the wise king, and we know the Cain part which is the uh, slayer of Abel. So we have evil and good, this Manichaean conundrum, right? And we sort of see this shift historically from the Elizabethan times to the King James times, you know, commissioning an English-speaking Bible, uh, writing out uh, one of the texts persecuting witchcraft, although there could be seen Though there were many persecutions that happened throughout Christian history. I mean, look at the Cathar, right? They were also a kind of Puritan. And um, they were seen as uh, heretical and there was a crusade against them when in fact they were just Puritans of a sort, right? So there's these Puritan people of God who now get confused with the demonic, right? And maybe this is something that oddly brings us back to the 1600s in a different way because you can see in the court of Queen Elizabeth, John Dee didn't see himself as a de 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 demonic person. He saw himself as learning the ancient speech, right? He was trying to get the Enochian language. And we also have in Solomon Cain, there's a reference in one of the stories. Uh, he's in Africa and they have, this tribe has knowledge of ancient Atlantis, right? So you have Solomon Cain goes into Africa and he meets the Africans there who give him the staff of Solomon uh, as he aids them, but also they impart to him this power. So actually he is bestowed by the descendants, by the African descendants from Atlantis, right? Uh, some Atlantean magic that kind of hands down. So, so this sort of is two different story, story arcs, though even though the simplistic story of, of Solomon Cain and Howard's sword and sorcery kind of writing, you see that there's a richness to it that takes us right back to that age of confusion of the 1600s, right? Sort of this transition between Elizabethan times and more modern Christian times, uh, the limits of religious toler tolerance, right? The Puritans were not tolerated and the witches were not tolerated, right? So you see that this about religious intolerance is going on. And then right in the middle of all this, we've got Solomon Cain's potential middle name. We have Solomon and we have Cain. And I saw somewhere someone had interpreted the L potentially to mean Lazarus. All right, I've got this odd little book here. And it, and it actually has this uh, cross. And Lazarus, if we are to accept the possibility at least, it's Solomon Lazarus Cain, right? And there we have a resurrection story in, and a necromancy story in the middle of the Solomon Cain legend. So Solomon Cain not only is a Puritan and a pirate, but he's also someone who has come back from the dead, right? And let's just talk about Lazarus for a couple seconds here. So there's a story of Lazarus according to the Gospel of Luke. There was a rich man once who was clothed in purple 
and lawn and fest feasted sumptuously every day, and there was a beggar called Lazarus who was at the gate, covered with sores. Um, this is where he dies. This is a different Lazarus. This is the three persons of Lazarus. The beggar Lazarus, Lazarus resurrected by... Um, Lazarus resurrected and Lazarus um, Lazarus the beggar and the Laz Lazarus who landed in Maximine in the sailing vessel so Lazarus was a friend of Jesus brought back to life but then we have this Lazarus legend uh, from France. It says, Lazarus with his two sisters, Mary Magdalene and Martha, is supposed to have been put on board a ship without a rudder or sail in the Holy Land. The voyage of the boat refugees ended in Saint-Marie-de-la-Mer near Marseille. There, Lazarus started to Christianize the province. Gradually, the cult of the saint and one of the poor beggar Lazarus, the medieval meaning of the latres leper, and the parable of the wicked man became mixed. He thus grew into the patron saint of lepers, leprosy at the time, frequent occurrences. So you have Lazarus not only as coming back from the dead, Lazarus as the leper, but also Lazarus who set off, almost like Moses, set off into the sea. And you can see here there's various uh, pictures. So is Solomon Cain also not only just a Solomon and a Cain reference, but is he also a Lazarus figure? Uh, there is some talk of Solomon Cain's brushes with, you know, the, the necromancy, the necromantic side of life. And this would place him between the two worlds as not only between good and evil, but between living and dead. So there's sort of a cross there and that. What do you guys think? Uh, just uh, some ideas of Lazarus Cain and, and, and the richness that even Robert E. Howard's kind of cursory backstory uh, reveals when you start looking into some of this stuff. So I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this. We'll be doing some more podcasts each week. Uh, please leave some comments below. I uh, would like to do some more about Solomon Cain. I think he's very interesting. And in the 1600s, a very interesting time period. So uh, thanks for watching and talk to you soon. Take care.